Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome, come on in. Don't mind the dust. I know this is a bit unexpected, but isn't it always a pleasant surprise I bring you? Go ahead, take a good look around. We won't get to visit much more after tonight. We're on Foundation territory, and I only have this one occasion to give you a tour. This year, when I asked the doctors to oblige my request for the annual October tradition of the SCP Vault, they responded with a discovery from a few summers ago they'd been keeping in mind for me. Not just something safe to share, but a total fascination that even they enjoy. We're standing in a now-abandoned movie theater, but its downfall came just months after hosting the premiere of the unauthorized director's cut of SCP-1955, Spleen Eaters from Venus. After that premiere, this theater became an item itself, still awaiting classification, but with an effect that seems to be in relation to the intent behind SCP-1955's creation, an enduring legacy for the director and studio behind Spleen Eaters from Venus. That legacy, however, is pure fiction. This movie theater is home to an entire history of movies by the same man in studio, and those films simply don't exist outside the building. They're completely real in here, but were never actually made. All of them are similar in quality and style to SCP-1955, and just like that first film, they share a commonality. Every film is in the Foundation's archives. Here's the twist, though. They don't appear as movies. They appear as actual items with stories of their own that deviate from the film adaptation. Every movie that's played here is anomalous, and it creates an SCP entry that acts as the film's source material. We're spending the night in an abandoned movie theater that makes 1950s era shock films and fake SCP objects at the same time. Now you probably understand why I was given clearance. We'll be discussing nothing the Foundation is actually concerned about, because the secrets shared are junk entries anomalously written to the database, cataloged in a side archive, and then promptly deleted. They've tried to find a way to fix it, but ultimately decided it's smarter to keep cataloging what's created in the offhand chance they need the record. And frankly, they're pretty entertained by what this theater comes up with, so why stop it? Now, I can't exactly show you these films. I've been told that might be detrimental based on what's happened to a few D-class personnel sent here for a showtime. But I am allowed to show you the posters that show up whenever a new movie's generated, so we're going to have some fun anyway. First, let's take a look at the case that started it all. SCP-1955, Spleen Eaters from Venus. Created in a redacted year from the 1950s, this is a terrible science fiction film released by the aforementioned defunct Hollywood production company. According to SCP Archives, the plot centers around the eponymous organ-consuming aliens and the efforts of American suburbanite Buck Johnson to stop them. SCP-1955 is similar to many low-budget science fiction films from the 1950s, with viewers generally criticizing the action, special effects, and sets as being of low quality. SCP-1955's anomalous properties manifest whenever any subject views at least 30 minutes of footage from SCP-1955 continuously. After the effect is triggered, viewers suffer from a permanent perception disorder. Any fictional narrative viewed is perceived to be a low-budget science fiction film from the late 1940s to early 1960s. Original actors and plot elements remain, but are altered in such a way that the following are consistent. Acting performances are generally lower in quality, with line delivery described as melodramatic or hokey. Special effects utilized in the film are altered so that they are on a similar production scale of films from the 1950s. CGI is replaced with actors in costumes, high-scale 3D effects replaced with technicolor light tricks, and so forth. Plot elements of the film are altered so that they fit a science fiction narrative. For instance, a romantic comedy will be altered to include aliens, cryptids, or similar elements and a redacted percent of films set outside the United States are altered so that their location is changed to the United States, usually in a suburban setting. Films in languages other than English are translated into English. Animated films and non-fiction is apparently unaffected. Unfortunately, viewers who have suffered the effects of SCP-1955 have not been cured. An addendum is provided containing a Foundation interview with one of the actors in Spleen Eaters from Venus. He described the director's behavior as odd during production. He barely said two words to anyone the whole time we were filming the movie, except to give us the most bare-bones directions possible. Kept mumbling to himself about how this was his masterpiece, always drifting off into space. It was pretty disconcerting. Soon as we finished up production, everyone left the studio and stayed as far away from him as possible. The agent conducting the interview noted it didn't do well financially, and the actor responded, It was a complete flop. I'd be surprised if more than a hundred people saw it. The head of the production company threatened to cut his head off if he ever saw him again. 
I never acted again after that, and as far as I know, he never directed another film. As for the director's reaction to the outcome, something snapped inside him, I think. I only saw him once after that. It was a few weeks after the premiere. I went over to his house to give him some consolation wine at bottom, and when he answered the door, he looked like a train hit him. Eyes bloodshot red, clothes hadn't been washed in days, the works. The actor reports the director didn't say much. Thank me for the wine, said he was going to invite me to see his director's cut once he finished it, said it was going to change the world of cinema. The actor didn't end up seeing the new version, stating, Anyone with eyes like he had wasn't doing anything I wanted to be part of. As we know, the director did leave a form of lasting legacy. It just wasn't in the way he may have envisioned it. So, what else has premiered here? Let's proceed right down the hall and take a look. In our first item, Day of the Sasquatch, a young boy returning home late at twilight is distracted by sounds in the forest that lead him to a giant metallic object that's crashed in the woods. He approaches but stops short as a door in the structure opens and the infamous Bigfoot steps out, who instructs the boy to take him to his leader. After being brought to the house of a very scared Mr. and Mrs. Pickett, Bigfoot explains that he and his brother still inside their spaceship are members of an alien race, the Sasquatch, some of which have been infiltrating the Earth for years and preparing for a global takeover in the name of intergalactic advancement colonization. This Bigfoot and his companions have come to warn Earth's leaders of the impending doom so they can prepare to defend themselves from hostile invaders. Mr. Pickett and his boy embark on a perilous journey to get Bigfoot to Washington while dodging attacks by emerging squads of Sasquatch determined to stop the whistleblower. Now, SCP-1000, the Bigfoot item entry, is a bit different. It's described as your classic Sasquatch, seen all over the world, and they've evolved alongside humanity in secret after 95-99% to 99 of their species were eliminated by genetic disease in a mass extinction event. Only those with immunity manage to survive and reproduce in present day. The anomalous effect those survivors have is horrifying. According to the entry, hominid, including humans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and non-immune instances of SCP-1000, that directly or indirectly observes any instance of SCP-1000 has a minimum 2% chance of being instantly killed through anomalous means via permanent cessation of brain function. This percentage is cumulative, and the longer a human views SCP-1000, the higher the chance of instantaneous death increases, at a rate of plus 1% chance per 20 minutes of viewing. This effect varies between individual members of SCP-1000 species, with some individuals carrying a death chance of 90%. The effect is also produced by dead individuals, though small fur samples do not exhibit the effect. The highest known population concentrations of SCP-1000 are at present located in the Pacific Northwest region of North America and the Himalayan mountain range in Asia. SCP-1000's presence has also been documented within the past five years on every continent. All known significant population of SCP-1000 located near human population centers have been eliminated. A document was added to the entry that requires level 3 clearance, a missive from Director Jones. Yes. SCP-1000 is Bigfoot. You think Bigfoot is funny, because we want you to think Bigfoot is funny. We've bankrolled Hollywood comedies and farcical documentaries, paid off men in gorilla suits, perpetrated hoaxes with bear prints and goat fur, bribed and brainwashed cartoonists to get especially silly depictions on children's television. Even the term Bigfoot comes from us, planted in the media in 1958, a term people would find even harder to take seriously than Sasquatch. The information in the article that you've already read isn't entirely true. There are two direct lies, and plenty of lies of omission. Director Jones goes on to write that there is no disease that's wiped out the Sasquatch. SCP-1000 also doesn't have any direct anomalous effect. It won't hurt you if you see it. We also lied about SCP-1000's intelligence level, Director Jones writes. SCP-1000 aren't chimp level smart. They're smarter. To be precise, they are exactly as smart as us. But while we were still wandering hunter-gatherers, they changed, like we would a few thousand years later. Tools, weapons, agriculture, domesticated animals, stable settlements. As humanity blinked in the Pleistocene sun, SCP-1000's population exploded across the night. They blanketed the planet in the tens of billions. They made things that we still can't comprehend, even though we've thoroughly studied the surviving pieces. Organic technology. They made trees and birds of prey grow into fast-moving ships, herds of animals that became trains, 
bushes that became flying vehicles. From insects and pigeons, they made things equivalent to cell phones, televisions, computers, atomic bombs. We were rare, like gorillas now, a few hundred thousand left at best. SCP-1000 understood we were intelligent like them, but avoided us just as we avoided them. Saw us as fairies, as gnomes, ascribed us supernatural powers, said we ate bad children while they slept in daylight. They fenced off our dwindling wild populations in conservatories, outlawed poaching, but in the underground consumed our bones as aphrodisiacs. Then their civilization fell, and we did it. By we, I don't mean the Foundation. By we, I mean humanity. The story is muddy. Supposedly, a trickster force god showed humanity favor, showed us the master's tools and how to use them. Why we did it, we don't know. Perhaps they hunted us. Perhaps we were simply afraid. Somehow we acquired SCP-1000's own technology, and with it, we instigated an SK-class dominance shift in which humanity became the dominant species of Earth. We wiped out 70% of SCP-1000's population in a single day. Supposedly, every flower bloomed that day while our enemies died in their sleep. Then we hunted the rest down. But we went further than just killing them. With a few of the more twisted of SCP-1000's devices, we drove the survivors mad, even those hiding beyond our reach. We trapped them in their own minds, blocking higher functions and leaving their bodies to fend for themselves like any ordinary ape. We slaughtered their living machines and burned their vast shining cities. We left no traces, not even our own memory. We turned one of the weapons on ourselves, wiped out any knowledge of SCP-1000 and the greatest civilization the planet had ever seen. Only a few humans protected themselves from the effect, kept the forbidden knowledge, just in case. The rest of us went back to being hunter-gatherers, none the wiser. You're going to read all about this in the Level 3 documentation, but I'll give you the short version here. SCP-1000 are somehow regaining their forgotten intelligence and knowledge. Maybe they never truly lost it. We don't know. This is why the ever-increasing number of Bigfoot sightings is so worrying. Why the attempts at contact, however indecipherable, are even more worrying. Yes, SCP-1000 are just like us. That's what makes them so dangerous. We wiped them from history and memory. We dissolved their civilization and we slaughtered most of their species. Just ask yourselves, if they got the chance, what more would they do to us? Next up, something a bit more fun than that first tale. A double feature. Come and feast your eyes on the poster for Behold, Moon Champion. Premiering one morning in 1969, just after 5 a.m., the Foundation reports that this film is the tale of Hal Caspian, the sole surviving astronaut in a deadly crash during Earth's first visit to the moon. Hal stumbles through the wreckage and tries to communicate with Earth, but finds his equipment malfunctioning. With no way to properly assess the damage from inside, he dons his spacesuit, grabs an American flag, and takes his first steps, planting old glory and then surveying the wreck. As he does so, he's accosted by the antenna-bearing moon people, who encircle him and bring Hal to their leader. The Moon King informs Hal Caspian that their kingdom is under siege from the other moon people, who live on the dark side of the moon, and they need a mighty warrior to assist them in their struggle. In return for Hal's help, the good moon people will personally fly him back to Earth and meet his leader to thank him for sending the only thing the Dark Side Kingdom fears, a barbarian from the Blue Planet. This film actually hits close to the anomalous source material entry. SCP-1233, an astronaut whose gear includes a propulsion jetpack that works like a science fiction dream. He calls himself Moon Champion and is virtually indestructible, having withstood ballistic fire and even being submerged in magma with no damage to the suit. The entry states, SCP-1233 is capable of communicating through a loudspeaker installed in its suit, and does so in a loud, somewhat grandiloquent, and declamatory male voice, demonstrating fluency in a number of languages and adjusting its speech to conform with whatever language is most commonly spoken by the surrounding populace. Its statements are generally coherent in structure, but are frequently rambling, oblique, irrelevant to the present situation, or lacking discernible context. SCP-1233's behavior is erratic, unpredictable, gregarious, cordial, and somewhat destructive, though its appearances are typically brief and infrequent, with sightings occurring only once per four to five years. Moon Champion always arrives with a bang, literally. He falls to Earth from an unknown height at terminal velocity, coming across to the naked eye like a shooting star, and then crash lands, causing a minor localized seismic event and a sizable impact crater. 
In almost all cases, SCP-1233 has landed a moderate distance away from the outer limits of a population center, usually a small to mid-sized town with a population not exceeding 30,000. It will then climb out of the crater and travel toward the nearby town either via flight or on foot. Its route to the population center is usually not direct. SCP-1233 will frequently stop to engage in various activities, seemingly at random. Examples of observed detour behaviors include inspecting various objects, such as farm equipment, buildings, and plants, standing still for variable amounts of time, chasing small insects, such as grasshoppers and butterflies, attempting to greet, converse with, or interrogate animals, such as livestock and birds, pulling up root vegetables or picking fruit from bushes and trees and pressing them forcefully into its closed visor in an apparent attempt to eat them, and marching directly into bodies of water, such as ponds and lakes. Upon reaching the town limits, SCP-1233 will engage in further activities which, due to its curiosity, appearance, extreme physical strength, and lack of understanding of human societal conventions, will generally result in civil unrest and destruction of public and private property. The entry then provides a transcript of events caught on a security camera as SCP-1233 enters a cafe. He approaches the 32-year-old man behind the counter, who is the cafe's co-owner, and says, Greetings, little girl! I am Moon Champion, Champion of the Moon, Defender of Space Justice, and Destroyer of Evil. I have come once again to your charming world to learn more of your strange culture, and to seek aid for my people in their ongoing war against the Moon Monsters. You appear to possess a vast wealth of the fabled nutrients and moisture for which this world is known throughout the galaxy. Are you the president of this planet? The man, Bob, bursts into laughter and offers Moon Champion a free cookie, who responds by thanking Bob for giving him a parakeet. It's noted that SCP-1233 rams the cookie into its unopened visor. The impact instantly destroys the confection and forcefully scatters crumbs in all directions. Delicious! I thank you, Lord President of Earth, for this generous gift, and may the light of justice forever shine upon your royal visage. Bob continues to humor Moon Champion, and we learn that he's on a quest to find help in fighting the terrible moon monsters who have besieged his people for countless millennia. It is his sacred duty as Moon Champion to conquer the Moon Monsters and save the Moon Kingdom. He's on Earth to see what assistance it can give him in the fight, and his first question for this trip is whether or not these puppies he's heard of can withstand the vacuum of space. I would like to befriend one and name her Moon Pup and take her with me on space adventures. Thankfully, that visit did not end with Moon Champion introducing a puppy to G-Force. Instead, when he was satisfied with his conversation, he saluted, turned around, and walked directly through a concrete wall in the cafe. There have been unfortunate circumstances resulting from Moon Champion visits, however. On October 5th, 2017, it was reported that he crashed in England and approached a man asking if he would help in the fight against the Moon Monsters. The man replied sarcastically, saying he had his toothbrush packed and was ready to go immediately. The entry says that SCP-1233 responded, at last, a brave warrior hiding in plain sight amidst these pastoral and bucolic humans. Let us away, fair meat fellow, and earn the glory of heroes. This day you brush your toots among the stars. We fly! The entity lurched forward and embraced the man, then activated its jetpack. The resultant sonic boom shattered every item of glassware within a 300 meter radius as 1233 accelerated to a projected velocity of 25,000 kilometers per hour within approximately 4 seconds, ascending into low orbit with the man in tow. Due to the unexpected timing of this event, observational satellites were unable to properly focus upon 1233 during the early stages of its exit trajectory. As such, the human's presence and status were unable to be visually confirmed. Tough outcome for that guy, but no use crying over liquefied human remains. Now, I did say this was a double feature, right? Let's proceed to the second half. Beware, Sea Champion is the companion piece that came out sometime after the premiere of Behold, Moon Champion. Its plot is as predictable and lazy as you might imagine for a spiritual sequel to the first film. Bud Corrigan is captain of a new submarine that's a scientific marvel, capable of diving deeper than any vessel before it. He and his crew sink into the depths of the Atlantic, rejoicing over the radio as they drop lower and lower, breaking the existing depth record and descending even further. Their party ends when a major light source fills the windows of the sub, blinding the crew and sending them into a panic as the whole vessel begins shaking. Everything goes dark and the film transitions hard to a new scene with Captain Corgan waking up on the floor of a palace. He and his crew have been captured by, that's right, the Sea People. And he's now in the throne room of the Sea King, who wants Bud's help conquering a load of sea monsters threatening the kingdom. In return for his help, he'll return the crew safely and send them back to the surface. 
Bud Corgan steps into a heavily modified combat version of his diving suit the Sea People took care of and goes off to fight. This film produced SCP-4233, an amphibious humanoid entity of unknown origin and composition that exhibits potent anomalous properties and operates under an unclear agenda. SCP-4233 physically resembles a human in a late 19th century diving suit, with a rigid copper helmet with glass viewing window and weighted boots. However, SCP-4233's body plan is disproportionate and larger overall than that of a baseline human. The entity stands at approximately 2.5 meters when fully upright, with an exaggerated torso supporting thick, oversized arms, resulting in a somewhat simian appearance. Each time it has appeared, SCP-4233 has carried a large stockless anchor, approximately 1.8 meters in length and weighing an estimated 550 kilograms. This anchor is thoroughly corroded and encrusted with barnacles, consistent with roughly 75 years of continuous exposure to a marine environment. It bears this item on its right shoulder, and to date has not been observed to use the object for any discernible purpose. 4233 is indestructible and unstoppable, and his appearances are totally unpredictable, except for the very general behavior. The entry states, SCP-4233 emergence events begin with the entity walking out of the sea and onto a beach or stretch of coastline, chosen apparently at random and with no regard for any civilian presence. Once on land, SCP-4233 will continue walking at a gradual pace, slightly less than 5 km per hour, in a straight line, only altering its trajectory to avoid injuring civilians, animals, and large plants such as trees. It has not been seen to stop or change pace at any point, and will often simply walk through, and subsequently destroy, objects in its way, such as fallen logs, unattended vehicles, boulders, and abandoned buildings. It will continue on its set path and walk forward until it reaches the ocean, occasionally crossing entire continents over a period of months in order to do so. Upon reaching the coast, it will stop, set down its anchor, clap its hands together once, replace its anchor, then continue, walking into the sea until it disappears from view. A document added to the entry concerns an encounter with SCP-4233 from December of 2017. Sergeant Kendra Hill of Foundation Task Force Sigma-58 made radio contact, and the anomaly was actually quite receptive and polite, saying, Hmm, new friends in the air today. I receive you, Miss Hill, as I receive your superiors. It is a good day for a swim, I think. A line of questioning was met with vague answers, but enough information to inform Sergeant Hill that 4233 was aware of the Foundation's work. You've caught me with little time to spare. Words and boxes are your great loves, and all love should be respected. But words wash away from me, and I am my own box. Such as it can be, in time and tide. 4233 was asked where it was going, and answered that it was headed back to the sea, in rather poetic language. Asking if there was anything it was looking for, struck a chord. There is. My brother. His signal is hard to find, so I must wander for a good spot so he can hear me. Who is your brother? Hill asked. 4233 replied, You have written of him in your lightning books. He appears in a suit like mine, though his is white and made for the void, not the water. My elder brother, the champion of the moon. He is very swift in the sky and very strong and often very silly, but he has been very, very silly lately. I wish to speak with him. He does not know I am calling him, I think. He has a hard time paying attention to things. 4233 said he wished to know if Moon Champion's stories are true. If they are, he wants to assist in the Moon People's struggle. If not, he wants help instead. Sergeant Hill asked what he needed help with, prompting this response. All life came from the sea, Miss Hill. Other things came from it too, and I must keep them from leaving. It would be very terrible if they did. I fight well at the bottom. My steel sings heavy death upon these creatures. But times change. They change very quickly, and though I am strong, I am slow. My brother moves with the speed of a thunderbolt and strikes like the justice he so loves. He would be a great help. Hill offers the assistance of the Foundation, but 4233 laughs. He applauds the spirit of the Foundation, but he needs to go it alone with the exception of his brother's help. We all must flow through our ways and bear our own burdens. You are yours. I am mine. Lay your noble guns to rest and quiet your battle songs. Turn from the shore and stand in the warmth of the great sun. You will be safe. Though they mass in journey droves, no foul leviathan shall draw breath beneath the weight of my mighty anchor. 
for I am Sea Champion. And with that, he clapped his hands together once and walked into the waves. And like Sea Champion, we'll depart from this spot now. There are more items to witness. Here's a fun one playing on an old fearful concept. Wailing of the Wax. Long story short, it's a horror movie about a security guard's night trapped in a wax museum on Halloween. Under the power of Sawin, the wax figurines come to life, and if they catch you, then you turn into a wax figure zombie too. What started out as three guards is whittled down to one, who has to save his own life and his girlfriend's as she makes a surprise visit. Standard old survival horror scenario sort of movie. It spawned a fun SCP entry though. Item 4153, The Wax Troop, composed of animated wax figurines portraying monsters and villains from classic horror cinema. Notable examples include The Werewolf, Frankenstein's Monster, Count Dracula, and Professor Henry Jared from the Vincent Price film, The House of Wax. SCP-4153 is active throughout North America. Its members appear at haunted attractions, such as haunted houses, trails, and cornfield mazes. Common venues include amusement parks, boardwalks, traveling carnivals, and strip malls. During their performance, instances of SCP-4153 use wax to alter their appearance, produce props, including fake blood and gore, and even manipulate wax objects from afar. Several instances of 4153 were arrested in 1993 after the owner of a haunted attraction notified police of a break-in. The intruders were attempting to operate their own set within the attraction. Foundation operatives were called after officers determined that the instances were not wearing makeup. All instances were transported to Site-09 for initial interviews and processing. Shortly thereafter, all contact with Site-9 was lost during a catastrophic containment breach. A few interviews were conducted with the captured members of the WAX troop. One date in particular stands out, between Agent Gerald Penn and SCP-4153-36. While discussing how the WAX troop's antics aren't scary and these monsters don't cut it by today's standards, Agent Penn begins choking. Number 36 notes, Oh dear, your tongue seems to have gotten away from you there. Here, allow me. Penn is reported to start whimpering and the subject continues, Hush now, I warned you about this. I told you that you mustn't disturb the wax before it hardens. That is a crucial part of the process. It needs to solidify, otherwise you risk disturbing the performance. Subject 36 makes an adjustment, resealing something, and we hear gurgling from Penn. The subject then says, Good as new. Now, let's take it from the top, shall we? And, action. Penn then begins his interview over again with no apparent notice of what's occurred. It was mentioned earlier that Site 9, containing the wax troop, experienced a contamination breach at one point. The entry states that during follow-up investigation, all on-site personnel were found to have had their skin and vital organs surgically extracted, then replaced with wax. Autopsies determined that although this occurred several weeks prior to the initial recovery of SCP-4153, all personnel remained alive up until the day of the breach. Notably, one body, that of Agent Penn, was found without its head. All instances of SCP-4153 remain at large. Next on the marquee, a slight break in style for the director through a very long dramatic horror piece by the name of The Hanged King. As the Foundation puts it, The Hanged King is the tale of a successful Broadway director who's pressured by the board of the theater he's had a long stay at to bring them something new and serious, something really unique and potent to get the papers scrambling to spread the word. He discusses the matter with his girlfriend, the blocking director, who mentions an old piece she heard about one she thinks was called The Hanged King. The director asks why he hasn't heard of it and is told that it's just not very popular. Apparently a lot of bad luck and misfortune surrounds the piece. She does know of a professor at her old university who may have a copy of the play, however, if the director is willing to take a look. From there, things unfold as you might expect. The director catches a train and meets up with a professor, who is very hesitant to hand it over, warning him up and down that it's cursed, a lot of bad things have happened, nobody even knows for sure who wrote it, and the director decides to pursue the play. This inspired the entry SCP-701, The Hanged King's Tragedy, and is described as follows. SCP-701, The Hanged King's Tragedy, is a Caroline-era revenge tragedy in five acts. Performances of the play are associated with sudden psychotic and suicidal behavior among both observers and participants, as well as the manifestation of a mysterious figure, classified as SCP-701-1. A redacted amount of lives are reported claimed by performances of the play over the past 300 years. Performances don't always end in an outbreak. Apparently only 36.78% have resulted in SCP-701 events, 
but those outbreaks follow a general pattern. One to two weeks, seven to 14 days prior to event. During the dress rehearsal period, cast members will begin to spontaneously deviate from the published text of the play. Rather than improvisation or gaffes associated with going off script, set deviations will be both orderly and consistent, as if the actors were working off a new version of the script. The cast and production crew will seem unaware of any change and, if it is brought to their attention, will state that the play has run that way from the beginning. The outbreak generally occurs during opening night, or else at the production with the greatest planned attendance, generally falling within the first week after the play's opening. One to two hours before event, SCP-701-1 begins to appear on stage in the final scene of Act 1, generally in the background or to the side of the main action. It may seem to enter or exit the stage area, but does not appear to ever enter the backstage or offstage area. It simply disappears when not on stage. The cast does not appear to notice or comment on SCP-701-1, at least at first. The event. 701-1 appears fully on stage during the banquet scene in Act 5. Here, it will be incorporated into the action of the play as The Hanged King. The cast will either murder each other or commit suicide, sometimes using items that seem to appear spontaneously on stage. Rioting breaks out in the audience, with viewers randomly attacking anyone in front of them, regardless of prior relationship. Following the event, if any of the audience members survive the initial outbreak, they may exit the performance space, in which case they will continue to engage in random or opportunistic violence. Normal personality will begin to return roughly 24 hours after the event. Surviving victims will generally exhibit signs consistent with a traumatic experience. Some will have no recollection of the event. Others may be rendered permanently comatose or psychotic. The entry states that the Foundation has been in a constant pursuit of material collection and performance suppression regarding the Hang King's tragedy. Having collected all known copies of the original play document spread in the year 1640, several major publishing prints, and even floppy disks containing the material captured during a raid, the Foundation's biggest success was the suppression of a TV adaptation before it could be broadcast. They're also in possession of a VHS tape of a high school performance that ended in an outbreak. An image of SCP-701-1, the being seen on stage, accompanies the entry. Going through external resource links for the entry leads to a summary of the plot for the Hang King's tragedy, which takes place in 1600s Italy. The plot concerns the fallout experienced by a group of nobles who successfully conspired to kill their king, who they originally meant to die from poison, but instead hanged like a criminal as a final show of disrespect. Their success only leads them to a marathon of betrayal, exile, murder, and a moment of genuine cannibalism. Do we feel well enough after that to journey from one royal court to another? Court of the Nightmare King reportedly premiered immediately following the credits for another film, just as the Foundation agent recording the previous had sent in a request to the resource team for a coffee. This sort of back-to-back -back showing had never occurred before, and certainly not under such coincidental circumstance. The film that played was a mystery that descended into horror as a nurse tried to uncover the source of sudden prophetic nightmares. With the aid of psychologists and sleep specialists at her hospital, she gains the power of lucid dreaming and comes to discover the presence of a man holding a very strange court deep inside her mind, dressed in flowing robes and calling himself the Nightmare King. Her story ends on a more hopeful and thorough note than the Foundation entry counterpart. SCP-4116, The Nightmare King, is described as follows. 4116 is the designation given to a series of specific recurring dreams affecting a single individual at a time. SCP-4116 has an anti-memetic effect affecting the recollection of dreams, with all victims only being able to recall the final dream in the sequence. This makes identifying persons who suffer from SCP-4116 impossible until after the affliction has passed. Despite having no recollection of the details of the other dreams, all subjects to date have manifested extreme night terrors and report intense fear and anxiety. 4116 afflictions typically last for two to three months, with a recorded maximum of eight months and minimum of one day. The final dream in SCP-4116 has maintained several key features present in all recorded instances. It is these recurring features among separate persons with no correlations that initially led to SCP-4116's classification as anomalous. The series of events in a standard 4116 dream sequence prior to awakening is as follows. The subject awakens in the dream. The surroundings consist of an extremely long stone corridor, the right wall solid stone and the left a series of large windows, with pillars placed periodically several meters inwards. Subjects report sensations of claustrophobia, despite the size of the hallway. The area is dimly lit by an orange light from outside, with long shadows and sharp visual contrast. 
The subject walks in either direction along the corridor for a long period of time, usually measuring several hours. During this time, they report seeing several pieces of regal furniture placed in the hallway, faded paintings on the walls, and several doors. If the subject attempts to open the doors, they will find them barred from the opposite side, and report a foul smell beginning to emanate from behind. The subject encounters and converses with SCP-4116-1. 4116-1 is a recurring sapient entity located within instances of 4116. The entity has been consistently described as an extremely emaciated and or mummified elderly human male, wearing red regal rose and a simple golden crown nailed to the head. Subjects who claim to have seen additional portion of the entity's body under the rose report similarly withered flesh and a thinly muscled build. Subjects have also described a tapestry consistent with medieval European crafting techniques stitched into the entity's torso. The details of the tapestry vary between cases, with subjects describing scenes such as a battle, a feast, and a parade being depicted. In addition, 4116-1 is described as having a long white beard and hair, and eye sockets extending unnaturally deep into the skull. 44% of reports also include 4116-1 carrying one of several tools or accessories, usually described as some sort of bladed implement, culinary utensil, or simple mechanical device. 4116-1 has repeatedly demonstrated several sociopathic personality traits. The entity believes itself to hold regal domain over dreams, particularly nightmares. The entity also displays a warped set of values regarding humans as raw material for unspecified purposes. Expanding upon this, 4116-1 seems to have no concept of permanent death, simply referring to such as waking up, suggesting that it has little to no familiarity with existence outside of SCP-4116. Documents recording the reported final dreams of those experiencing 4116 point to varying degrees of satisfaction the man in the dream expresses with the sufferer. He makes comments about people failing to help him make his kin as well as falling short of providing food. He also hints at a desire to add people to his court. A document is attached to the entry concerning attempts to help a member of D-Class recover the missing dreams that preceded their meeting with the Nightmare King. After being administered a test drug to get past the mental block, they reported memory returning and shared this. My head is killing me. Okay, I'm uh, sliding down the hallway? No, I'm being dragged by some nasty mummy guy in a bathrobe. Don't like that very much. He's jabbering on about something, about how he's going to use me to make something. Seems excited. Oh hell, I'm starting to see why this was a nightmare. He's hauling me into a room he opened. There were lots of doors in the hall and he opened one. Uh, it's dark, I can't see what's inside yet, but ugh, I can smell it. Oh, I love him. God, I'm not saying anything else until I get an aspirin. Two cracking sounds are heard. The D-Class's eyes rolled back, and the following is reported. A third crack is heard, and the top of D-5042's head splits open. A metallic edge can be seen jutting out from the wound briefly before withdrawing back into the skull. The lights fail for several seconds, and upon reactivating emit a flickering orange light instead. A desiccated hand is now visible, emerging from the opening in the D-Class's skull and attempting to pry the wound further open. Security cameras fail, and no more footage is obtained. Agent Scott and Dr. Samber escaped unharmed to a security checkpoint. Upon re-entry to the testing room, the D-Class's cadaver was found with the head split completely open and deep scratch marks covering the inside of the skull. The door had been forced open. How this was accomplished is unknown due to the failure of security cameras. The entry notes that no further instances of SCP-4116 have been reported, but four days after the event described, a string of violent murders occurred overnight in a redacted town near the testing site. No culprit was ever apprehended. Let's keep that note about dark happenings in town going, shall we? Now that you're even more wide awake than you were before. The Phantom Flood is a return to form for early works by the director and studio. Melodramatic, serious yet campy, some obvious effects. It takes place in the lakeside town of Coldwater, Missouri. The inhabitants are just finishing their 4th of July activities when news broadcasts come in warning of a major torrential downpour set to begin early morning, so it would be for the best to get all party equipment and objects susceptible to heavy winds inside or secured. Tom Terryson and his family follow instructions, then wake up the next day to find that, indeed, the rain is coming down and it's pretty relentless. Tom assures his son that the storm will break soon enough, but two days later, the storm continues, and TV signal is starting to come and go. And that's when Mr. and Mrs. Terryson start seeing the ghosts appearing in the midst of the storm. People from their past in cold water who they thought had all moved away, or just live far enough in town that they no longer encountered them. 
This film generated SCP Entry 3300, The Rain, and it's quite a tale. SCP-3300 is an annual event in which the populace of Clearwater, Montana, henceforth SCP-3300-1, disappears and is replaced by a new set of citizens. The SCP-3300 event typically occurs in the mid-portion of June and lasts 6 to 18 days. The first 48 hours of each event are marked by a light continuous rain over the entire city. This portion of the event ends when the rain transitions to a severe thunderstorm lasting for the remaining duration of SCP-3300. The interior of a 3300 event past this point has never been observed. Any attempt by the Foundation to explore the event has ended in either a total loss of personnel slash equipment, or failure to even enter the phenomena. When the SCP-3300 event ends, all previous 3300-1 instances will have been replaced by new iterations with completely new appearances, personalities, and memories. Beyond remarking on the unusually severe nature of the storm, new instances showed no recollection of the event. Instances of 3300-1 behave identically to baseline human beings. However, no record of any instance prior to their appearance from a 3300 event exists. Instances will occasionally share names, professions, certain memories, and broad personality traits with previous iterations of 3300. 3300-1 instances are unaware of their anomalous nature and the circumstances surrounding their existence. Physical and post-mortem examinations reveal no differences from baseline humans. Instances of 3300-1 outside of the town when 3300 occurs will disappear several days after the event begins. All attempts to observe this disappearance have failed. SCP-3300 is accompanied by a moderate cognitohazardous effect. Outside citizens learning about the existence of the town of Clearwater or its citizens will give little thought to them unless the subject is brought to their direct attention. Attached to the entry is a journal from Clearwater inhabitant Margaret Lane during the event in June of 1995. This is the only record available of what occurs during the anomaly from the inside. There's a dream I've been having, which is weird because I don't usually remember my dreams, but I've had this one like three times in the past week, Margaret writes. In it, I'm not myself. I'm in a small hut standing above the bed where my daughter lies. Her skin is red, blotchy, hot. I'm praying that the disease won't take her, praying that she will recover or that this is some other sickness. It's no use, I know. The course of my husband won't let me forget. Another of the healthy, a boy who thinks himself a man, calls us together, the few that remain. I gaze around the room and see the same expressions on their faces that I feel in my heart, all except the boys. He grins as we enter and gestures to the bowl of water in front of him. I have found it, he says, the key to our salvation. And then it ends. Weird, right? No idea what to make of it. Anyway, I'm heading to Sam's, so this will be it for the day. Great clouds on the horizon. We need the rain. As the days go on, Margaret jokes that she can't remember how the sun looks. The situation becomes more serious as the storm noise grows to a volume that at points needs to be shouted over just to be heard. One minute it was drizzling, the next someone flipped a switch to dump the entire Pacific Ocean onto our heads, she writes. Internet and phone are completely down. The few seconds of clear radio we can get is just a barrage of tornado and flood warnings. I swear some of the people in the sound must be absolutely insane, because sometimes when lightning flashes, I can see them walking around outside, some of them just standing there. Her next entry comes as she's in the back of her friend Jared's van. They're going about 80 miles per hour down the highway, and her friend Isabel is crying next to her. Margaret is afraid she's going to die. It couldn't have been more than an hour ago that this happened. We were all at my place. Sam, Jared, Mike, and Isabel had all come over. I hadn't expected them, but Jared insisted he wasn't going to let something tiny like a biblical flood stop us from exploring the bomb levels of the Dread Lich Arsganoth's domain. So we rolled up and started playing like everything was normal. Sam DMing with the stupid little monster accent she does, Isabel and Mike arguing over every scrap of treasure and possible trap we come across, Jared struggling just to keep us all from killing each other, Mom in the other room pretending she wasn't listening in. It was Isabel who first noticed the banging on the door, like someone trying to break it down. They all stopped and stared at each other in disbelief until Jared rose and grabbed the fireplace poker, then opened the door and saw a family standing on the porch. A mom, dad, two kids. I'd never seen any of them before. For a second we all just stared at each other and then the dad shoved past Jared and said, Why are you in my house? Mom had come out of her room when she first heard knocking. When the guy said that she flipped out instantly. What do you mean your house, asshole? This is my house. What the hell are you doing just barging in here? I swear to God, you've got 10 seconds before I get the cops over here. God, 
I remember being annoyed, embarrassed, wishing she wouldn't flip out over everything. The dad's expression didn't change. He stepped forward again and Jerry tried to hold him back. When he did, the dad just flung him, snagged Jared by the collar and tossed him through the living room into the kitchen. Jared smacked into a counter and went limp, and the dad said again in the exact tone, Why are you in my house? That was when mom charged him with a golf club. He barely had time to react before she swung it into his chest. For a second, she looked pleased with herself. I'm sure she was already forming the story to tell all her friends about how she fought off the home invader. When she tried to pull the golf club back and she couldn't, the expression disappeared. The guy didn't look a little bit hurt, not even phased. The club was stuck in his chest and the skin around it was rippling, like when you throw a stone into a pond. Water tripped out from where the metal entered skin. The man then removed the golf club and struck Margaret's mother in the head. Then he did it again and again, harder and harder, saying, My house. My house. The group panicked, Mike and Sam grabbing the unconscious Jared, Margaret grabbing the journal by instinct. They piled into the van and drove to the police station where the lights were on, but no one was inside. Their next thought was to head to the hospital in nearby Lenhart. We've been driving for six hours now, Margaret reports. We're almost out of gas. Jared still isn't awake, and we haven't made it to Lenhart yet. We've doubled back twice, looked for road signs, building lights, anything, but there's nothing. No signs, no cities, not even a gas station. We haven't passed another car since we left my house. The rain's falling just as hard out here. Mike says we need to turn around, try to get back to town before we get stranded. Isabel says that's crazy. We need to keep looking for the hospital and we don't have enough to make it back anyway. Sam says she's going to keep driving. It's all we can do at this point. A while later, another entry. Jared is dead and the car is too. No gas. No idea where they are. No idea what to do. Under the exhaustion of it all, Margaret falls asleep and has another dream. I stand ankle deep in a vast, clear river. I am holding the corpse of my daughter. I'm not sure how I recognize her as taken by the sickness as she is. Her hair has fallen out. Her skin is entirely covered in black scabs that hide even her eyes. Flecks of cracked skin fall away as my arms rub against her body. But for some reason, as I look at her, I don't feel sorrow. I feel hope. I kneel and place her body into the water. It drifts on the surface. Then the water engulfs her, makes her a part of it. She becomes the current that takes her and I know it will sweep her to the sea where she can finally be at peace. But the work isn't done. I turn, wade back to shore where the blackened body of my husband waits. As I do, I become cognizant of the others, the survivors. Each has with them the bodies of their children, families, friends. Eighteen survivors. Hundreds of bodies. One by one we take them to the river until only we remain. I woke up to the sound of Jared evaporating. It took me a moment to realize what was going on. The others were all scrambling around the body and I couldn't get a good look. All I could see was the steam filling the car. When I pushed my way through, I saw his body was boiling. That's the best way to describe it. Bubbles writhing and popping across the surface of his skin. Drops of water leaping off him and burning where they touched us. The shape of him almost completely gone, aside from a vaguely human-looking lump within his clothing and some ridges that might have been his face. Sam tried to touch the water to... I don't know, stop it? Save him? Catch him? But the heat of the steam pushed her back. All we could do was watch as Jared fizzled away, until the only thing left of him was vapor and soaked clothing. The tale of the survivors from here turns truly grim. They find a sporting goods store to lock up in, and after some time spent trying to wait out the rain, Mike shoots himself. When the group runs to the sound and find his body, it's not blood that covers the wall. It's water. Sam panics, touching Mike's head, and it comes away wet but clear. Before I could react, she thrust more fingers into the wound. Water ran down her hands as she dug through what should have been his brain. Water sloshed in the chalice of his skull. When we lowered his body to rest on the floor, it was water that pooled on the wood. Sam leapt up, ran to the counter, snatched a knife from its sheath and held it to her arm. We stared at each other. I didn't want her to do it. Didn't want to see what would happen. She sliced open her arm and water spilled from the wound. We stared at the injury, too distracted to notice Isabel calling to us. It wasn't until she ran over and yanked on my sleeve that I remembered she existed. 
Outside was all she said. Hundreds of people had gathered outside the window, unmoving silhouettes staring through the darkness, filling the street. When lightning flashed, I saw the faces of strangers soaked by the rain. They've been there for two hours now, haven't moved an inch. They're outside every window, every exit. I don't know how long they're willing to wait, but I'm damn sure it's longer than we have. Margaret wrote only two more entries from here. The first documented Sam's departure from the store. Margaret didn't stop her, saying, The thought wouldn't make it past my brain, like there was a wall between my nerves and my body. So I just stared as she stepped into the rain. The silhouette shifted as soon as she was outside. They opened up to let her through and she vanished into them, into the dark. I don't want to go back. That's what she said before she left. In her final message, Margaret describes one last dream. She's in a storm, wind whipping at her like razors, freezing rain, biting skin. Except she has no body. She's part of the storm. She hears the screams of her village around her and they all fight to escape to no avail. And then I am falling, rushing to meet the ground. For a moment the earth embraces me. I remember what it felt like to feel the dirt beneath my feet and the sun on my skin and the crisp air in my lungs. Until the storm steals me again and I'm pulled back into the screams of my comrades. I woke up and Isabel was gone. Just a puddle of water on the floor. I think the rain is speaking to me. I can hear it ever since I woke up. I don't know what it's saying, but the whispers in my ear are getting louder. When I cover my ears, it's still there. If I scream, it rises over the screaming. It wants me to join it. I'm its child and it misses me. It can't bear to be apart. What can I do? What can I do? The strangers are still outside watching me, waiting for my choice. Because they know what my choice will be, don't they? There's only one way this can end. I can wait and starve or shoot myself or slice my wrist or walk out into the rain, but it's all going to end the same way. The water is eternal. The water will remain no matter how polluted it becomes. At the end, we all become rain. I don't want to go back. A mysterious and sobering situation for sure. Usually, I greatly enjoy the rain, but it may be difficult to avoid thoughts of this tale the next time there's a good thunderstorm. How about we switch gears now to something a bit more fun? Right down the hall, we have another horror number, this one with a bit of quirk. The Devil's Price is more of an extended Twilight Zone type of plot. There's a man who constantly looks out for his frail younger brother, a guy who seems to have inherited all the genes from his parents, while his sibling gained only the leftovers. This lot in life weighs heavy on them both, but especially the younger, whose episode of woe over being a small fry is interrupted by a radio broadcast offering the impossible. Body swaps for those who dare to come and find the advertised shop. Later that evening, the older brother finds his younger is missing when they had plans to get dinner. He catches the ad playing on the radio and realizes where his brother must have gone, then gives chase. Upon arrival to the shop, he's met with Dan, the mysterious but ever-smiling shopkeep, who did encounter the younger brother, and a quick trip down to the basement will reunite them, he claims. What follows is a rescue mission in an impossible underground factory that resembles hell, where others who came to the body swap shop cry out from cages, hoping to be rescued before their soul to the real customers, who wait for them just beyond a wall of fire. The associated SCP is quite similar to what were shown in the film, but not with such a heartwarming sibling relationship plot. SCP-5049, Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot, is no store you ever want to visit, despite its attractive advertisements. SCP-5049-1 are extraspatial portals capable of accessing SCP-5049 through previously non-anomalous doorways. These doorways become 5049-1 instances when SCP-5049-2 is watched and will remain so for 15 minutes before spontaneously demanifesting. 5049-2 is a two-minute infomercial for Damon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot, which is capable of interrupting television broadcasts. These infomercials usually go a little something like this. A logo for Damon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot appears in baby blue bubble lettering. The image fades to a tall humanoid, SCP-5049-A, standing at a store counter. 5049-A has dark green skin with patches of thick brown fur randomly covering its body. 
It's also described as having goat-like legs ending in large pointed hooves, and takes viewers through a tour of the place, where various human bodies can be seen hanging from the walls. His speech is as follows. Hey there, folks. It's your man, Demon Dan, coming at you with all the latest and greatest deals from Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot. We just accepted a shipment of brand new models that would make even the most discerning customers weep with excitement. Let's see what we got. Looking to make your way through the capitalist hellscape that makes home look cozy? Come try on one of our newest businessman models. If you're looking for the extra challenge of inequality, the businesswoman model may be the right fit for you. Now, maybe you're thinking, but Dan, business sounds hard. I just want to have some fun. And the fine team here at Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot have got you covered. Who has more fun than kids? No one, that's who. For a limited time, the purchase of any child size unit comes with a complimentary 50% off coupon for parental units. You just can't say no to a deal like that. Here at Demon Dan's Discount Homunculus Depot, we know it's not all fun and games. The bravest among us have a mission to accomplish. The Seven Lords are ever planning their invasion after all, so you're looking for function over form. Well, we've got that in spades down here in the Tactical Services Department. You'll be kicking ass in no time when you're wearing the latest models at the best prices. And I've got a special treat for you. We are happy to announce the VIP Lookalike Department. We all know how difficult the creation of homunculus is. It's a fine art that takes years of practice. So when a replacement order on VIPs comes in, Every detail needs to be perfect. You too can look like famous icons from around the globe. The report says the curtain is pulled back, revealing several human bodies that resemble celebrities. Demon Dan wraps up by saying, If you're viewing the advertisement, then you've been selected for entry. Please enter the nearest door for instant deals and upgrade those old duds for one of our newest models. What are you waiting for? The nearest doorway will then turn into an SCP-5049-1 instance, a portal to the shop itself. Discovery of this item actually occurred in the midst of the Foundation when the commercial aired on Safe Storage Warehouse 13's Break Room TV. Four Foundation members were present, including Agent William Birkin. He immediately decided to investigate and enter the door to Demon Dance. His chest-mounted camera recorded the visit, first catching four small, scaly humanoid creatures fighting over a human body. Agent Birkin didn't get close, in an instant, he found himself welcomed by Demon Dan and drew his sidearm. When Demon Dan stepped closer, Birkin fired, but only succeeded in making him disappear. Birkin was disarmed from behind and then hoisted over Dan's shoulder, who then took him on a special tour of the facility. Captured footage revealed human beings in varying states of torture and human skin on tanning racks. Birkin was thrown into a cage and workers were told what parts of him to salvage, then to put the rest in the pulp grinder for filling. After several attempts over time to infiltrate the facility, the Foundation only succeeded in capturing customers at Demon Dan's. 21 demonic entities. Interrogations didn't lead to much intelligence. Eventually, they managed to organize a sit-down with Demon Dan, and they pulled it off for a very simple reason. The Foundation was scaring business away. They attempted to strike a deal with him. A reasonable percent of all deceased human bodies acquired by the Foundation would be given for product. In return, they would get a detailed list of all customers, their place of origin, and the physical appearance of their new bodies. Dan wasn't happy at all with the deal, but recognized that if the Foundation kept attacking publicly, there'd be no business at all. Just as Dan was about to agree to the deal, however, a gurgling noise came over him and his eyes began to glow bright orange. A much deeper, more powerful voice rose from his throat, declaring that the Foundation were fools that allowed to toil in its own delusions. You hinder nothing. You jail and barter to no avail, it stated. Your time is coming. Demon Dan's head then exploded, covering the interviewer in purple fluid. After a period of 17 days without activity, a new infomercial appeared, but with a replacement for Demon Dan. The Foundation has found no method yet to shut down SCP-5049. And now we have only two films left to observe. Are you ready? The Crooked Man is a much darker film in this catalog, taking place in a home for wayward boys and centered on a burned-out older male counselor. Originally a hopeful and optimistic force in the grounds, 14 years of work have taken their toll on him, as his sister points out while visiting early on. Whatever happened to you, she asks. You used to be the brightest man in the building. What's got you all bent out of shape? At the end of the conversation, the sister presents the counselor with a long box, inside of which is an ornate cane with a unique design. A little something to always know I'm here to support you, she says with a smile. 
He thanks his sister for the gift and she leaves. When he exits the office that evening, the camera hangs ominously on the box before fade to black. Soon the counselor finds himself dealing with horrible, unexplainable attacks against the boys in the home that occur late at night, leaving segments of their bodies stretched out to impossible degrees. Phone calls to his sister reveal she got the cane during a trip to the UK. A long-distance contact to the source uncovers further information about the cane's history, which involves similar incidents to what's happening now, courtesy of a wicked spirit known as the Crooked Man. The Foundation entry counterpart is SCP-783, going under the same name. It's listed as a hostile entity currently preying upon the residents of Temby, a rural hamlet in Oxfordshire, England. It has a period of activity lasting roughly 70 days over the fall and winter months, occurring every 12 years. It exclusively attacks those who are alone and indoors after sunset. Buildings housing SCP-783's current target will experience a steady degradation of their structural integrity. Outwardly, this is visible as faults and breaks on the outer facade which lend affected structures an angled or crooked appearance. This anomaly extends to any objects which breach the affected building's exterior, causing immediate and severe deformation that is invariably fatal to living subjects. To date, personnel have yet to prevent an attack or been able to provide any means of assistance to SCP-783's targets. Due to this, as well as 783's effect on recording equipment, little is known regarding 783's exact appearance and the nature of its anomalous attributes. Victims of 783 attacks exhibit gross deformations in their body structure as a result of dozens of compound fractures along their long bones and severely displaced vertebrae. These are healed via the rapid generation of excessive cartilage and osseous tissue. Victims display hyperelasticity of their epidermis and musculature to accommodate the extra tissue, with one subject's forearm extending over 2.4 meters and another having a recorded height of 12.5 meters. Despite the nature of these injuries, most victims are alive after the cessation of an SCP-783 attack, though they often suffer full body paralysis or remain in a persistent vegetative state. 27 living specimens have been acquired and placed on life support. They are held in a wing of the local hospital requisition for foundation use. The residents of Tembe are aware of the existence of SCP-783, though speaking of it publicly is considered taboo. Researchers have documented a playground song shared among local youths regarding the anomaly. There lived a crooked man who made a crooked deal. He kept a crooked cane in his catch and crooked creel. He stole a crooked child who cried a crooked squeal, and that crooked little man was broken on the wheel. A research endeavor was conducted by the Foundation using D-class personnel situated in a property in Tembe. Records show results on day 43 of surveillance, beginning with live feed distortion. The D-Class reported hearing scratching noises on the first floor. Major video corruption occurs as he investigates and a knock is heard at the door. The D-Class approaches, asking who's there. Communication with the Foundation resulted in radio silence. With no guidance on how to proceed, D-Class 209 opened the door, resulting in a loud snapping noise heard throughout the house. All light bulbs on the premises burst simultaneously, including floodlights focused on the property. What follows is horrific footage of D-209 attempting to escape from SCP-783 as his limbs and fingers are cracked and elongated several times. His body is stretched out enough to occupy the majority of the living room. An incident was reported to have occurred outside the home during the same moment the lights blew out. All 27 living victims in Foundation care went into seizure. Despite the fact that the majority were brain dead or wholly paralyzed, they convulsed for several minutes. Two present researchers were injured during the incident. Life support systems for several patients were compromised, killing five. A vast quantity of earth was disturbed on the outskirts of town during this time. Investigation of the area where the earth was disturbed revealed several elongated toes protruding from the ground. A dig team was assembled, and by the following afternoon had unearthed a mass grave, approximately five meters across, containing several dozen victims of SCP-783. The bodies were well-preserved, yet desiccated. Their number was unable to be immediately ascertained owing to the fact that they had been piled atop one another. They were oriented head down, with their arms extending deeper into the pit. Furthermore, most of the victims' limbs had become intertwined or knotted around each other, preventing exhumation without the use of sawing instruments. Researcher Singer elected to extract a tissue sample. During this process, the soil beneath him caved and he tumbled into the pit. The body shifted due to his weight. As he struggled to gain footing, the tangle of limbs gave way, and he fell out of sight. Agent Collins promptly commandeered a length of rope and tied it around her waist. She tasked several nearby personnel with reeling her in upon her signal and entered the pit. 
Approximately 20 meters worth of rope was drawn beneath the corpses as Agent Collins descended. The line became taut after several minutes. She signaled for extraction and was recovered safely. Upon debrief, the agent testified to the existence of an anomalous locale, the entrance to which was located beneath the victim's corpses. A temporary leave of absence was granted to Agent Collins. A terrifying tale, be it an SCP entry form or as an anomalous movie. And now, for our final feature presentation, In the Dragon's Domain. This film is centered on an American couple taking a trip abroad, with a major temple of their journey in Germany observing the ruins and memorials from World War II. The next destination lies in Austria, a matter they discuss with the hotel clerk. He says their plans are wonderful, but if they would like to witness a marvelous secret of the land, there's a town standing on the border between Germany and Austria that is wonderfully old world with natural sights and feelings like no other. Drachendomain, he says wistfully. Not enough people travel through it. The couple take the advice of the clerk and instruct their driver the next day to take them through Drachendomain as they depart. They enter the land, noticing that what the hotel clerk told them was very true. It's a marvelous place, filled with rustic sights and people in lovely antiquated dress. Along their drive, the car begins acting up, and they all must stop and shelter at an inn until someone from a nearby town can come along and fix the engine. It's once they're able to take a walk outside that the couple notices a huge tower in the distance that resembles an icon in the center of the town crest, carved into the stone archway of the inn they're staying at. The mystery of the town's ability to stay somewhat locked in time grows as the couple encounter sharply uniformed men in several places, who identify themselves as a sort of police force, and all want to ask questions about the couple when encountered. Before long, their driver goes missing, and it's up to them to discover where he went and why so much of the media and iconography in town relates to that mysterious looming tower. SCP-5050, the entry spawned by this film, is the tower itself, situated right where the movie placed it. The Austrian-German border, specifically the Mittenwald municipality in Germany and the Innsbruck Land district of Austria. The report states the tower works in a 1,374 meter effective radius, and its frequency range was so extreme as to be considered anomalous by the disruption of applied physics. SCP-5050 also broadcasts television and audio signals as well as radio signals. These broadcasts can be occasionally intercepted by the Foundation, because the process requires a significant amount of time. The broadcasts usually do not last long enough to be fully interpreted. These media appear to be somewhat procedurally generated. The signal from SCP-5050 primarily affects the surrounding town of Dragon Domain, designated SCP-5050-A. 5050-A appears to be consisted of a mix of technology from the 1960s to the 1980s. The level of technological advancement in SCP-5050-A seems to be slowed. Its inhabitants appear to be affected easily by the signals, but no direct testing has been available to support the conclusion. Neither 5050 nor 5050-A have any historical construction records. A spectrogram taken from one frequency projected by the tower shows a message. Listen to the tower. Praise the tower. Become one with the tower. Over and over. Discovery of the anomaly in Dragon Domain was made in 1987, and there are several logs by research teams sent to investigate. They read out as an excellent story. The first research team's logs show them gaining steam just as they're snuffed out, followed by Foundation document requests on the extinguished team's behalf that reveal the town was a creation of the SCP Foundation, and yet the records of its creation are impossible to find. In the second half, a new research team is sent out, hoping to finish what was started and discover what happened to the first team. Threats and warnings from the tower come in across the TVs they encounter, and the police force of the town is shown to be an active physical aspect of the tower's will. An insider makes contact with the team and only manages to arrange a meeting after the tower conducts one by escorting them to the police force's viceroy who is a conduit for the tower itself, boasting about its power in comparison to the ability of the investigators. The insider who catches them on the way out of the meeting reveals themselves to be a survivor of the original research team, who is not quite the person they once were now, referring to their body as a shell. They have been turned into a tower speaker, meant to spread its message. A series of clues delivered by the insider during conversation lead to the entrance for the facility that runs the tower. Once inside, the team catches as much documentation as they can, revealing the origin of SCP-5050. The Tower of Draken Domain was an agreement between the O5 Council overseeing the SCP Foundation and the US government, designed as a dual experiment in artificial intelligence and mind control, for the purpose of disrupting potential Soviet aggression through the construction of covert radio towers. 
The ultimate activation key to the tower lied in the installment of a personality matrix for the AI, which would put it under the control of whoever designed that matrix. Documents reveal a conflict between several groups working on the project about the personality matrix, all of whom ended up installing their own matrix hoping to subvert the others without them knowing. When the tower was turned on, the result was a multi-personality mess that had resolved the issue of conflicting minds by combining them into a single Mad King personality, which took over immediately and began overtaking all connected systems. The tower locked down the facility and vacuumed the air out, killing everyone inside. It ran the area ever since, undisturbed until its rediscovery decades later. How did such a thing even happen? As a covert project between the US government and the foundation that was limited to a small foreign area, it was easy to abandon, and would have been humiliating for anyone to discover. The O5 Council was embarrassed by the findings in modern day and issued an apology statement for its decision making in the 1960s, informing the foundation that following the failure of 5050's creation, they had signed an agreement with the US government to never work together again in the interests of war. There is no telling how many projects had occurred until the failure of the tower. And there we have it, a night at the Anomalous Theater, complete. I hope you've enjoyed the showings tonight, and as far as credits go, I would like to thank all the entry authors, all of you, and my supporters on Patreon, who keep the Nightmind Theater running. If you've enjoyed this content and the work I do on Nightmind and the Nightmind Index for Unfiction Projects, please consider joining. You can be a patron for just $2 a month and still get your name in the credits of all major videos. Thanks for joining me in the dark again this evening for another annual SCP Vault. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and like our favorite October specials, I'll be seeing you again real soon. Please exit the theater in an orderly fashion, get home safely, and sleep tight.